Hi, I'm Mimi Gonzalez, and you are watching Out at the Center. Let's do it. Two-time Tony Award-winning playwright Edward Albee visited the center to talk about his work, the art of playwriting, politics, and aging as a gay man in America. You can download or listen to the entire conversation as a podcast. Visit gaycenter.org slash out for the link. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce, I will be interlocutor and our guest of honor for the evening is Tony Award winning, Pulitzer Prize Award winning, Obie Award winning. If I left out any awards, he will tell us, Edward Albee, playwright. <laughs> the um, artist, or the playwright, if you will, uh, as a, um, does he have, or she have a responsibility in terms of the political or social climate of the time? Depends upon who the writer is. If the writer thinks so, then yes. And what about you? Well, I, I've always been uh, of, the, of the opinion that unless a play, since that's what I write, but this is true about, uh, I think it's true about paintings and string quartets and poems also, that if a play isn't there to hold a mirror up to people and say, look, this is who you are and this is the way you behave. If you don't like what you see, why don't you change? If a play isn't socially useful, it's just decorative and, and there's no reason to go see it. I prefer plays that uh, uh, upset me, plays that tell me things that I didn't know, plays that question my values, because uh, I think all plays have got to be useful. All art must be useful or else it's a total waste of time. This is a democracy, and we're allowed to have any kind of art that we want. We, we can have art that tells us uh, something about ourselves as a society and as a culture. If we want to pay attention to that, that's fine. If we want to have nothing but escapism that lies to us and tells us half-truths, we can have that, because we're a democracy. We, we, we have the right to, uh, to, to misunderstand as much as we want to. Are there, are there any critics that you you would pay attention to or take seriously? I used, to, I used to believe that we should treat critics the way they used to treat, treat American Indians in this country, that, that, a, that a good critic was a dead critic. Because <laughs> that was our attitude about American Indians for a long time. Um, but yeah, there are some that are bright. There, there are some that are honest, some, some that uh, really care about theater. There are always some that, that are like that. But the majority are there to write reviews, I think, to make the theater safe for people who want to go to the theater and have nothing happen to them. The role of people who have been around longer than other people. Well, there's supposed to be um, an accumulation of wisdom among the older folk. Uh, but I don't necessarily, spending much time as I have with, with older folk, I don't necessarily find that uh, they know anything more than um, other people do, and maybe have started forgetting an awful lot more about what they knew before, yes. Are you called upon a great deal, though, to be involved with political social issues, and how do you decide uh, where you'll use your name? Whenever I can get a forum to say something. Not, you you but, have one, say it. Well, I just said something, didn't I? <laughs> I think every, I can't imagine there's a person in this room, A, who is not a Democrat, <laughs> and, and B, who was, was not totally fed up with uh, uh, the, the, the destruction of democracy that the last seven years has, has, has put upon us. There, there can't possibly be. I don't know, personally, anybody who is not disgusted by this administration and horrified by it and, wo and wondering why more people aren't uh, going to the barricades, why we, we turned into such a pa fucking passive society. I don't get it. I recently uh, said to you, you're celebrating your 80th birthday, and your answer was, no, everyone else is celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> your views on, on... It's better to get there than not get there. <laughs> but your views on, on uh, ageism and how seniors are regarded in our society. And as... Seniors? What is a senior? Seniors mean people who are no longer juniors. Oh, well, 
Uh, one thing that you do notice, unfortunately, in the gay world is that your visibility decreases considerably the older you get. Have you found that a negative or a positive? Uh, both. Both. Oh, I find it so comforting. Do you? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I used to find, I didn't, I didn't used to care because I was in a very, very good 35-year relationship with, with, with my friend Jonathan Thomas, who died a couple of years ago. And so these days, if I think that might, might be fun to date or something, um, it's very difficult being invisible. Or visible only because somebody knows who you are. Both problems. Tell us what it was like. I lived Tell gay, us what gay life I was in the 60s. gay life in the 60s and, and, and still do. And, and it wasn't, you know, by which I mean I'm still living gay life in the 60s. <laughs> Jonathan Ned Katz, Amber Hollibaugh, Thomas Glave, and the Sutter's Terry Bogus sat down for a panel on Coming Out at 70 to discuss issues of growing old and LGBT senior visibility. I would call people that were my age and say, you know, I'm now doing aging work and I'd love to have you come and speak on a panel. And they'd say, I, I you know, it's not my issue. You know, I think myself, really? Could have fooled me. This panel is about um, facing head on some of the uh, personal and political problems associated with LGB old age and how we might combat these problems together. I found myself horrified at turning 70. I suddenly saw myself through the eyes of younger people around me, saw myself as shabby, graying, lumpy, not particularly stylish, and worse, potentially predatory. I immediately began to self-police, to monitor my own mannerisms and interactions to make sure that I didn't do anything that might be interpreted as an unwelcome, inappropriate come on. Old age, the one time when black people actually attain respectability, when we are perceived as finally being sexless and of little possible harm to anyone except ourselves. Aging isn't something that happens when you're 65. When you're 20 and you're frightened about being 30, when you're 30 and frightened that it's over, when you're 45 and worried that by the time you actually claim your own, your own sexuality, no one else will want you. My realizing that at age 70, I'm not as often perceived as a sexual object by other gay men, and I can't so easily engage other gay men sexually is profoundly uh, unsettling. I did not have older femmes to come to and say, I, when the negligee doesn't look the same, what do I wear? <laughs> what do I do? How low do I keep the lights? <laughs> I was piloting a curriculum on LGBT aging, a cultural competency curriculum at a nursing home that had 700 people in it. It was a relatively liberal nursing home. They were very terrified about LGBT people being there, though we were. I'd keep asking questions about sexuality and people keep telling me no, no, no. The other thing they kept doing is sending, saying to me that I really needed to talk to the, the recreational specialist that worked at the nursing home. Why? Well, you just should. She said, that's because um, I'm going to tell you what I've done uh, that is not acceptable in this nursing home, but I've done it anyway, and nobody's stopping me. There are 700 people here. Many of them want to remain sexually active. They want to be in a sexual culture. So I have set up a sex night in the nursing home. I take the rec room. Everybody comes. Then the door gets shut. We have dancers. We have sex shows, we have videos, we have porn magazines, we share with each other, we talk about sex, we talk about desire. Some of us, some of the people there then partner with each other, though that's not a public thing, but we have an active sex culture because what I realized was that people wanted to be engaged in desire regardless of whether they were physically partnering with anybody or not. And I said, you are a hero. You are a hero. Where is the broader consideration for old folks in our movement? The movement as a whole is constructed for the young. Although I readily acknowledge this movement's sidelining, fetishizing, and general disregard for youth and young activists, we can also be guilty of over, overcorrecting that 
with a message to old people to get out of the road. How profoundly frightened um, all of us were in not just simply confronting our own aging, but confronting a movement which we had helped create and which we knew we were um, likely to be invited to lead. Talking to younger people, younger activists about why I do aging work is to say to them, I'm trying to create a movement. I'm trying to ask you to engage in creating a movement you will be welcome in. Because if you don't do the work of aging right now, you, like, like I now find, will have created a movement that will not welcome you when you're an older person. I also thought that many more people, myself included, myself included, would have long learned by now, learned at least from the AIDS epidemic, that this thing we call life really is phenomenal, supreme, and that we should consider ourselves lucky if we make it through life to become old, to become old queers. Center Voices, the Silvio Rivera Law Project, and Legal presented a panel of formerly incarcerated individuals sharing their experiences of being queer and behind bars. Two years ago, gay housing in Rikers Island, we had heard they were closing it. They had protective housing, um, and, but over time it wasn't working, and so in December 2005 they changed it. And they created three different situations. You know, one is called a general population, one is general population escort, and the third is protective custody. The people that are in protective custody are in a one-person cell. They sit there for 23 hours a day by themselves, and they're out to eat. And really, that's it. And so here's something to keep people safe, and what it does is they're completely isolated. And we, we saw some of the people, the men sitting in there, it looked awful. I did uh, 14 years and change in a bunch of different prisons and jails, and some of them were city jails and county jails, and then most of it was in the federal system. Humanity is illegal in prison. That's, it's just sort of like a reverse <laughs> system of what it's supposed to be. So anything that makes you wholer is repressed in prison. And so, of course, that means your sexuality. Going in there as a bisexual female, that alone, just saying bisexual, I was discriminated against because, you know, I was femme, I had the painted nails, the nail polish, the long hair. One very vicious woman guard uh, used to do strip searches on me that were basically illegal, where she had me standing in places where men, guards, and prisoners could see me. The vulnerability of having your sexuality known, the most intimate things about you, known by people who are acting as your enemy, is an extremely corrosive and horrifying thing. Um, I realized that due to a lot of the abuse, the women there were on medication because of all the stress that was going on inside. It gets to you and it creates an aftermath of um, some sort of stress syndrome. There was no peace there. You couldn't, um, you couldn't bunk with someone else and just con be consoled or hug someone. Male guards, pat search women prisoners as a matter of course. And I found that really difficult. You know, the things that I would have slugged a guy for on the street, I had to stand there um, and take. And there was a situation at one prison where there was one um, male guard who, who literally, uh, I mean, he would, he would pound us between our legs and he would grab our breasts, anyone that he knew was gay. We tried to grieve it, and we were told privately that he was told not to do it, but of course it was legal, quote unquote, in terms of the system. It's a story of a young woman named Victoria Arellano, who is a Mexican uh, transgender woman who was uh, taken to a deportation center in Southern California, who was HIV positive and passed away um, due to her complications. She was not given immediate care once she was placed in the deportation center. So I just want us to be mindful of the fact that, you know, when, it, when we talk about the prison industrial complex and you know, what it's like to be on the inside, just take a second to think about what it's like to be a transgender individual behind bars and having to deal with the reality that you are a very, very small minority within this huge spectrum of people that is within the prison industrial complex. It, it destroys families, it takes people out of the environment, it isolates people. The commission, they're still trying to get bring back neighborhood jails. People are going to be waiting for trial, they should be in their neighborhoods. Easy access to their family instead of an island in the middle of nowhere in Long Island Sound. The Community HIV AIDS Mobilization Project, or CHAMP, 
presented a forum at the Center on Rethinking HIV Risk for Black Men Having Sex with Men. The event drew a large audience to discuss the issue of rising rates of HIV in this community. A lot of folks may know that there's a, a conversation that's been happening in the media specific to young men who have sex with men and HIV risk. On January 2nd, the New York Times published a story about um, increasing HIV AIDS uh, incidents in young gay men in New York City and then followed up just a few days later on January 14th with an editorial and the close of the editorial um, read as such. Nearly 6,000 gay men died of AIDS in the United States in 2005. Still, many young men appear to have persuaded themselves that the infection is no longer such a big deal. Public health officials need to continue to distribute condoms, encourage testing, and treat those who are ill. Leaders in the hardest hit communities need to start speaking out again. The fight against AIDS is far from over. There have been several studies that have looked at racial discrimination as well as homophobia and how that influences sexual risk among black MSM. And you find a direct link between discrimination and engaging in sexual risk behavior. But unfortunately, we have very few programs that deal with discrimination. We have very few studies that really look at discrimination. And this is something that we need to incorporate into our, into our literature. Being depressed is also associated with greater risk behavior. And you find exactly those same types of um, studies that are coming out with black MSM. People who don't know that they're positive are likely the ones who are responsible for the ongoing epidemic right now in the United States. It's very, very hard to talk about HIV if you don't talk about the other epidemics going on. And there's a, a, a term I recently um, learned last week, syndemics, which really talks about the intertwining or interconnection of several other epidemics. That is what's going on in our community. It's not just a, 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 a HIV epidemic, it's a homelessness epidemic, is the epidemic of homophobia, of shame, of hate, of, of, of denial, and all those things play into this. And until we begin to address the epidemic from those contexts, we'll never ever change the course of it. The fact that almost 30 years into the epidemic, there are only um, two um, interventions for black gay men, and not even two that were organically developed by black gay men is a serious indictment of what's going on. Sexual risk with male partners being HIV positive and unprotected anal intercourse or number of sex partners is all associated with gay identity, not non-gay identity. Those things are also associated with disclosing your sexual risk behavior, not non-disclosing your, your sexual risk behavior. So everybody, unfortunately, seems to have everything inverted. It's not the men on the down low that we need to worry about. It's not the men on the down low who are the men who are more likely to be HIV positive. It's men who are out and men who are gay identified, men who disclose their sexual risk behavior, who are more likely to be HIV positive. And you see that in study after study after study. Those young black MSM who reported low levels of social support, who were stigmatized by their families, stigmatized by their church, et cetera, they were more likely to engage in higher rates of risk behavior. Peer norms certainly influence sexual risk behavior. Peer norms is basically what your friends think. So what do your friends think about condom use? What do you believe your friends think about condom use? If you believe that your friends use condoms all the time and have favorable attitudes towards condoms, then you're more likely to use condoms yourself. If you don't believe that your friends have favorable attitudes towards condoms and using condoms, then you're less likely to use condoms yourself. And you see that dynamic specifically among black MSM is that peer norms is a really strong predictor of engaging in sexual risk behavior. Men who have higher levels of social support are less likely to engage in risk behavior. So that's certainly a dynamic that's something that we can work on in terms of interventions for black MSM. CDC um, developed one intervention right now that they're in the middle of publishing with ha um, housing and urban development to see if you provided housing for people living with HIV, um, would they adhere to their meds? Would they engage in fewer risk behaviors, et cetera? And of course, you're finding that those men and women who received housing and were previously homeless are adhering to their meds, they're not engaging in high rates of risk behaviors, and et cetera. So we're dealing with some more of those structural issues. Many of us have been saying enough is enough for too many years. It's time for those of us who are not doing this work but who are part of this community. You see, we don't see ourselves as organizations. We see ourselves as part of the black gay community. So it's imperative, it's absolutely critical that you be part of us. You pick up the phone, what is it I can do? 
Can I volunteer? Can I answer the phones? You know, and that is how you build community. New Fest, New York's LGBT Film Festival, celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. New Fest artistic director Basil Siokos sat down with Out at the Center to give us a preview of this year's festival. Out at the Center is happy to welcome Basil Siokos, the artistic director of New Fest, the New York lesbian, bisexual, transgender Don't film festival. Gay. gay. <laughs> LGBT, as we are here at the that's, center. That's easier, yes, exactly. So, welcome, Basil. Thank you for having me. And I noticed on your website, it's saying that 2008 will be the 20th anniversary that's right. of New Fest this that's year. That's right. It's our 20th anniversary. It's the 25th anniversary of the center right, this yes, year. Yeah. So we're having all these coincidence mm -hmm. anniversary things going on when Kate Clinton was here. Right, right, right. It's the 25th you know, right, anniversary exactly. tour DVD. What do we have to look forward to? To this year at New Fest? Um, I, I think it's a really uh, strong lineup actually. We, um, we experienced, I kind of referenced it earlier, but we experienced a rather dramatic increase in submissions this year and so it just made my job even harder and better at the same time. I mean there's a lot to choose from. Um, so the, the selections that we came up with I think are um, quite strong. Um, you know the, the ones that I think people are usually spend the most time talking about are the you know the gala films, the opening, closing, um, and centerpiece films. Um, and I think they're a lot of fun this year. Um, we're opening the festival on June 5th with a film called True Love. It's a teen comedy um, about a young woman who has uh, lesbian moms and gay dads. Um, and she moves to a new school, uh, is immediately sort of taken under, uh, taken, taken to the confidence by a closeted gay athlete who tr tries to pretend to be uh, her boyfriend, but then she falls in love with a guy that she thinks is gay but turns out to be straight. It's just, it's just really, it's a fun, fresh film, um, really smart. Uh, it's going to appeal to a really wide range of, of audiences, lesbians, gays, straight, everything. The other two films that I'm, that I'm very excited about are, are centerpiece screenings, which take place on the two Saturdays of the festival. Uh, the first one is called Chris and Don, A Love Story. Uh, it's a documentary, it's our documentary centerpiece, and it focuses on the, uh, the long time love affair between Christopher Isherwood and his partner Don Bacardi. Just heartwarming, amazing film. Uh, with just great access uh, and great archival footage. It's a film that everybody who's seen has just fallen in love with, so we're really excited to, to be doing that the first weekend of the festival. Um, and then the second weekend of the festival is, is one that I think will garner a lot of attention because it's a, it's a really strong film that deserves a lot of exposure. It's called Steam uh, by a director named uh, Kyle Schickner, uh, and it stars Ali Sheedy, um, Academy Award nominee uh, Ruby D, and a third new actress who, um, sort of the ingenue who plays the sort of lesbian segment in the film. Just really a uh, wonderful look at three women at three different stages of their life. They meet in a steam room every week or so and sort of just relate their lives. And then we close the festival with Tom Gustafson, who's a, lo a local New York filmmaker, a uh, film called We're the World Mine. It's set in a um, sort of all boys prep school. It centers around the production of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. One really interesting thing about that film is uh, that film was done as a stage screenplay reading um, by New Fest uh, two or three years ago as a way to sort of help bring attention to the film and sort of help maybe get some investors and, and whatnot. So it's just really gratifying to see that film actually come to fruition. I noticed last year, you know, you had focus uh, on right. religion and family and right. international. And do you have uh, yeah. certain well, categories? You This year there's four focus areas again. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in all of them, obviously. I, I developed them in terms of the focus areas, but uh, I have a focus area on African American images. We have again; uh, it, it was just an, it was sort of a, a gaby boom this year again because there's a ton of films about gay parenthood, mm -hmm. um, both both lesbian and and gay. Um, a lot of a lot of gay male parenthood actually. Um, one which is sort of a retrospective oriented in uh, a focus area that um, you know sort of speaks to our 20th anniversary, which is a look at a number of films, both documentary and narrative, that look back at the early days of AIDS. Um, AIDS is another subject that, um, that used to be at the forefront of what New, what New Fest and other film festivals, gay film festivals, would, would look at back in 1989, in the early, early, uh, in the early 90s and late 80s. Finally, um, we have, and I sort of referenced this earlier as well, you know, we can, we can sit in New York City or in other cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, and just, oh, we're gay and there's no problem with that. Other places around the world aren't quite so, so fortunate. And so we have a, a section that uh, it's basically, it's sort of like activism slash repression. And it looks at uh, different societies around the world uh, where being homosexual is still punishable by death. 
And what, uh, like, what's the best kept secret of New Fest this year? What would you say? This year, we're actually really happy um, and fortunate that we had a, a, a major donor that contributed funds to create a lounge space for us during the course of the Fantastic. festival. So the lounge is going to be located at HK Lounge. That's located at 39th and 9th Avenue. We're going to be updating our website with information uh, by the by the middle of the month. Um, that's newfest.org, uh, and you'll see we'll have the the. The, every every piece of information that you need to know, the, if the film guide, descriptions of films, pictures, information on membership, ticketing, etc. So the festival runs June 5th through the 15th. And that's all for this edition of Out at the Center. As the credits roll, we'll watch some highlights from the popular Bears on the Run tour, sponsored by Logo, that benefited the center. I'm Mimi Gonzalez. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. We welcome you to Bears on the Run. I said nobody loves my baby, no, no, no one now. Bears just weren't handsome people. We also had talent. See, I ain't so different. See, I ain't so different. See, I ain't so different than you. I gotta talk to you guys about the pictures you're putting in your personal ads. As they go, I'm totally committed to my partner. We've been together 20 years. We're super happy together. I love him to death. I'm just looking for friends only. Friends only, please. No hookups here, no hookups. Chat only, just looking for some chats. But for some reason, every picture in their personal ad looks like this. No hookups, please. No hookups. Check out my butthole, though, it's real nice.